Hey, what up, Seekers? We are doing here a history of pantheism. If you missed our first video, it was on Eastern pantheism. Check it out up here. And we did an introduction to pantheism, defining it and talking about how it was coined. Check it up right here. And if you're new to the channel and would like to explore philosophical mysticism together with us, make sure to subscribe, like, and join us for the ride. Much love. In this week's video, we are talking about Greek pantheism, all the way from the first Greek thinkers down to the Neoplatonists. But even before early Greek philosophy kicks off, early traces of pantheism can be found within the theological thought of the Greek mystery religions, particularly that of Orpheism, where pan, all in Greek, may be cognate, share the same etymology that is, with the Greek god Pains. The primordial deity of creation and procreation that is depicted as emerging forth from a cosmic egg, containing a primordial mix of the elements, split into two by the two gods Kronos time and Anachne inevitability or fate. Ionians, 6th century BCE. But it was among the first recorded Greek thinkers in the coastal city of Miletus in the Ionian region of Asia Minor, today Turkey, where the birth of natural science and philosophy in earnest takes place, where for the first time attempts were made to understand how nature worked, what it was constituted of and how it functioned, and what the ultimate nature of things really were. It was there for the first time that Western pantheistic doctrines were laid out in philosophical form. At the time, around 5th and 6th centuries BCE, in their quest to find a unified explanation for the diverse physical phenomena around them, to make some sense of and to find patterns in the chaotic and multitudinous world which surrounded them in their everyday lives. After emancipating themselves from the polytheistic explanations, where each natural process was attributed to another god and goddess, the quest for one god, one first principle, one theory to explain all phenomena, the heart of the scientific and philosophical enterprise until today, it was there that the metaphysical doctrine of monism was born. The belief that all existence is fundamentally one or unified. And it very quickly became the reigning metaphysics amongst the Ionian thinkers, sparking what is known today as the Ionian Enlightenment. Fun fact, by the way, the name Ionia is where Egyptian, Assyrian, Persian, Babylonian, Turkish, Arabic, Sanskrit, and Hebrew get their word for Greek. Yavana in the Sanskrit and Yavan in Hebrew, for example. What unites these early thinkers is their insistence that all things must spring from one common source, the arche in Greek, a somewhat animate primordial substance, giving us a theory of a substance or material monism, if you may. And because these Greek thinkers believed these primordial substances to be divine, they qualify as well as pantheists, in addition to being monists. Anaximenes believed this primary substance, this primordial material, to be air. Diogenes of Apollonia, going one step further than Anaximenes in the direction of pantheism, writes in a fragment that comes down to us. And it seems to me that that which possesses thought is what people call air, and that by this, by air, everyone both is governed and has power over everything. For it is this which seems to me to be God and to have reached everything, and to arrange everything, and to be in everything, and there is not a single thing which does not share in it. As you can see, he thought very highly of air. Thales proposed that this first principle was not air, but water, later on also interpreted in a more pantheistic direction, to mean that the god in all things was the divine energy of water manifest in each particular object. In the works of Anaximander, the divinity of the prime matter becomes even more obvious. In his case, it was the Epirion, the boundless infinite, which he proposed as an uncreated, indestructible, and indeterminate being, which contained, embraced, and ruled all things. Continuing the pantheistic tendency of the Ionian philosophers, the Ephesian philosopher Heraclides, in a point that has struck resonance with much of modern philosophy, in the cryptic fragments of what we have left of his writings, makes the argument that change is the basic condition of reality that process, transformation, flux, and becoming are intrinsic to reality, claiming that all things are merely the changing forms of the great primordial substance, which he labeled fire, and 
that the change upon which all of existence is dependent was simply the act of divine wisdom and reason, logos in Greek, taking action in this material world. You might recognize Heraclitus for his well-known quotes, Pantarei, everything flows, and no man ever steps into the same river twice, probably because the person's not the same person I stepped into it and the river's not the same river. That is Heraclitus. Next up is the philosopher Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras had a similar approach to Heraclitus. He believed nous, mind, to be the principle which gave order and movement to all things, and that this finest and purest substance, divine mind, was diffused and spread throughout the universe. In a class of his own stands Pythagoras, moving leaps and bounds beyond the Ionians in the directions of a pure monistic pantheism. For the Pythagoreans, in a way that is still fascinating for many modern people, this unified reality that we experience is governed by mathematics and geometry. They saw numbers as constituting the essence of all things and as responsible for harmony in the world. The Pythagoreans go on to have a new movement start from them called Neo-Pythagoreanism with their own forms of initiation and strange rituals and prohibitions. But putting that all aside, on the metaphysical side of things, because we're not talking about Neo-Pythagoreanism just yet, Pythagoras taught that God embraces all and brings everything into being yet remains one. And that if we take away every mode or condition of existence, every appearance in existence, all that remains is still the one being, which cannot be made either more or less than one, says Pythagoras. Eleatics, 5th century BC. The next major Greek school following the Ionians were the Eleatics, named after their center in Elia, a colony founded by Greek refugees in southern Italy, who in the midst of their intense metaphysical abstractions, developed a deeply spiritual and mystical philosophy. Convinced by their predecessors in the absolute unity of all existence, the Eleatics rejected any metaphysical notion of multiplicity, plurality, or change. The first step in this direction was taken by Exophanes, who on rational grounds moved away from the anthropomorphic polytheistic gods and goddesses of Homer and Hesiod to posit a unified theory of reality. The world of plurality, he argued, was merely a manifestation of a great changeless entity, unmoved, unmoving, changeless, indestructible, and unitary. And this unity, Exophanes called God, a God who perceives, governs, and apparently contains or at least embraces all things. Exophanes provides us with a case of monistic pantheism again, since in his view, the absolute unity called God is united with our changing world, therefore making it pantheistic. Exophanes also has the vibe of a mystic to him, portraying himself as bewildered and perplexed at the edges of his understanding in his endeavor to grasp that which he knew was beyond his limits, but which he was no less certain still existed. Whethersoever I turn me, I am lost in the one and the all, says Exophanes. Quite the mystic, I'd say. Parmenides, 515 BC. Next up, we have the first philosopher to inquire into the nature of existence itself, giving him the name the father of metaphysics, whose influence is felt in all subsequent Western philosophy, Parmenides. Possibly a student of Exophanes, Parmenides argued that given that the nature of the absolute was unchanging, eternal, and necessary, the notion of change or becoming at all was impossible. His logic is as follows. For becoming to occur, some form of being must come from something that is either being or non-being. Now, if it comes from being, then it already is, and no real change has taken place, both before and after the alleged change, being remains all the same, and hence, there is no becoming. And to suppose that something has come from non-being would be nonsensical, because according to Parmenides, ex nihilo nihilo fit, out of nothing comes nothing, i.e. something can't come out of nothing. Hence, on Parmenides' account, the phenomena of change is basically just an illusion. This paradox, amongst others, encouraged Parmenides to accept a changeless and absolute reality, leading him to conceive the world as a unitary, indivisible, everlasting, motionless whole. This position situates Parmenides somewhere between a monistic and a acosmic pantheism. An acosmic pantheism is one which denies the reality of the world, cosmos being world, a being the denial of. And this is because he sees the world on the one hand as real but changeless, and on the other hand, 
his attitude towards the change and variety that we do experience in reality, he sees as merely as an apparent, as an illusion, which makes him an acosmic pantheist on that side of things. If you'd like to read more on these highly enigmatic and frankly quite mystical early Greek philosophers, I'd recommend reading Ancient Philosophy, Mystery Magic by Peter Kinsley, a great book where he gets into the mystical and magical side of these early, very, very bizarre, but highly influential Greek thinkers. Also, for more classical academic works where you can read the fragments of these Greek thinkers themselves with interpretations, check out Pre-Socratic Philosophers by Jeffrey Kirk, the Pre-Socratic Philosophers by George Barnes, the First Philosophers edited by Robin Waterfield, Early Greek Philosophy by Jonathan Barnes, the Pre-Socratics by Edward Hussey, Philosophy Before Socrates by Richard McKiernan, and check out this great video from Justin Sledge, my friend over at his great channel, Esoterica, where he looks at the esoteric side of these epic early Greek thinkers. The next great philosopher is a character whose broad shoulders loom so large over all of Western philosophy that the latter has been referred to simply as footnotes on Plato. Plato, perhaps most famous for his theory of the forms, or ideas, that all manifest things are merely instantiations of some pure universal type, to which in comparison our perceived reality is merely a shadowy copy, most memorably encountered in his Allegory of the Cave in his book The Republic. Plato in his writings applies this theory to the world at large, which he refers to in his dialogue Timaeus and in other places as a blessed god, the world. Plato calls a blessed God. Seeing God, or the good, as he also calls it, as the supreme form, the highest idea, embracing all the other forms within itself. What I think this means is that the form or idea of God, in Plato's theory, represents a unity which contains within itself all the true essences of each thing, of which the world, in totality, is a manifestation of. Therefore, when we talk about the entire world itself, we can call it a blessed God because it represents all the ideas that are contained within this great idea called God or the good. Does that make sense? Now, with a character as important and complex as Plato, there is bound to be endless debate about what exactly Plato believed, and we're not even going to have the hubris here to voice an opinion and take side in this debate. That will be left to very well-qualified Plato scholars. But... What we can say reliably is that throughout history, pantheists have claimed Plato as one of their own for the first reason which we already mentioned, and secondly, because in Plato's teachings, we find him adopting a dual principle of the divine, uniting both being and becoming, absoluteness and relativity, permanence and change in a single context. To be fair, Plato envisioned the categories of absoluteness as situated in one deity, an absolute and eternal God existing in eternal, changeless perfection, and that of relativity in a separate deity, in what he calls the divine world soul, which contained and animated the world and was only as divine as a changing thing could be. But it seems that Plato wasn't entirely chill with this separation between the absoluteness and relativity, and in Plato's dialogue, The Laws, he tries to make sense of this duality by employing a metaphor of a wheel in circular motion, which simultaneously combines change and motion experience at the rim with the stationariness and the fixed nature of the center of the wheel, the hub, in an attempt to explain how a deity could both exemplify unchanging absoluteness and temporalized change. To understand the significance of Plato's theory here, we have to situate it in the context of earlier Greek thought, which we've been speaking up until now. According to Plato's predecessor Parmenides, nature is being itself, the all. And beyond the all, nothing exists, because the all is being, and beyond being, there is nothing. There's nothing which is non-being. That would be a tautology, according to Parmenides. Parmenides uses this logic to arrive at the being of the all. And in the process, he shakes off all particular beings and becomings which are only appearances, as we spoke about, which is why he rejects change in all things of that nature. Essentially, Parmenides, in his inability to explain the relationship of individual beings to reality and being as such, individual beings end up just losing their individuality, particularity, and autonomy. He does away with them. Unlike Parmenides, however, 
Plato paves the way to secure the separation and ontological consistency of particular entities, all the while affirming the transcendence of the forms, the ideas, by emphasizing that particular beings are becoming changeable, whereas the forms are eternal and immutable. Plato's theory allows him to have his cake and eat it, because the forms for him represent that which is unchanging and absolute, and the manifestation, the instantiation of the forms, can be changing. And much of Plato's philosophy is trying to make sense of the relationship and the contact between the forms and the matter which they instantiate inside of. This is a super important and fascinating development in the reconciliation of the conflict between the absolute and the relative, the changeless and the changing, the one and the many, with ripple effects running straight into Neoplatonism and the rest of the history of Western philosophy and theology, as we shall soon see. But before we get to Neoplatonism, I want to talk about Stoicism. Stoicism was one of the foremost Hellenistic schools of philosophy, following Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum, with the other competing philosophical schools being Cynicism, Epicureanism, and Skepticism. Stoicism, known at the hands of its very fine thinkers like Seneca and Epictetus, charts a path to eudaimonia, happiness, human flourishing, contentment, blessedness, a bit of a difficult word to translate from the Greek, but it means a cluster of those ideas. The path charted by the Stoics to eudaimonia is by learning to accept the given moment as it presents itself to us, and not allowing ourselves to be controlled by our desires for pleasure or of our fear of pain. But besides for their path to eudaimonia, which the Stoics are better known for today, the Stoics also developed a robust system of logic and carried on an extended contemplation on the nature of reality, i.e. metaphysics, and expressed views concerning the nature of things in these early days when philosophy and science had yet to go their separate ways. And in relevance to our topic here today, the Stoics, beginning with Zeno of Citium and culminating with the emperor philosopher Marcus Aurelius, represent a sophisticated philosophical pantheism with heavy Heraclitian traces laced through. Firstly, the Stoics accepted the position of Heraclitus that fire was the primordial element present in all manifest and changing things. They also refer to this primordial principle as the logos, literally the word, but in this context meaning something more like the principle of reason that orders and animates the cosmos. They believe that this reasoning substance pervaded all of nature. But unlike Plato's immaterial world soul, the Stoics, being through and through materialists, believed that the Logos was composed of some sort of subtle matter, similar perhaps to the Nous of Anaxagoras, which we spoke about earlier. And when properly conceived, the universe as a whole was pervaded and animated by this Logos, this act of reason, the anima mundi, which they called God or nature. And, continues Stoicism, that the life of reason brings human beings into harmony with God, Logos, and nature, and helps them understand their place in the universal system. To quote the Stoic Chrysippus, the universe itself is God, and the universal outpouring of its soul. It is this same world's guiding principle, operating in mind and reason, together with the common nature of things, and the totality that embraces all existence. That is Chrysippus in Cicero De Natura Diorium. If you have one ear to the future here, you should start hearing the foreshadowing of the most rigorous and celebrated Western pantheist, the Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who we will get to in great length in an upcoming video in the series. Trust. The next uber-important historical representative of philosophical pantheism is one of my personal all-time favorites, the School of Neoplatonism. While not originating in Greek proper, it happens in Alexandria, but they are students of Plato and a continuation of Greek thinking. When people ask me who I would take on a dinner date, if I could choose anyone dead or alive, without saying it out loud, lest I out myself as a philosophy geek, present company excluded, my immediate eternal response is Plotinus. Founded by Plotinus in the 3rd century CE, and of inestimable influence on all subsequent philosophical and religious thought up until the modern period, Neoplatonism was a continuation and modification of Plato's attempt to reconcile the paradoxes created by the relationship between the one, i.e. God, and the many, i.e. the world. Between the absoluteness and the relative, the infinite, the unchanging, and the finite and the transient. This 
conflict was a serious, serious issue for Greek metaphysics and a serious issue that continued through Western metaphysics. There is a lot to know about Neoplatonic metaphysics, but as far as our brief survey goes, these are the most salient elements. Plotinus held that all manifestations of being, material and immaterial, are emanated by the expansion or overflow of a single immaterial and impersonal divine source, which he identified with the one of Parmenides and the good of Plato. This Neoplatonic one is the ground of all existence and, as the good, is the source of all value and virtue. Reality in the Neoplatonic schema may be pictured figuratively as a series of concentric circles expanding and flowing forth from the one, the fountainhead of existence. This overflowing is seen as involuntary and a necessary consequence of the very nature and constitution of the one, a point which put Neoplatonism at tension with classical understandings of God's voluntary creation of the world ex nihilo in the Abrahamic faiths of the West. So just to paint you a little picture of the Neoplatonic metaphysics, it kind of looks like this. At the summit, or the center of the system, lies the one. Perfect, simple, infinite, transcending every separation, and containing everything within itself. From the one flows nous, mind, or intellect, a mirror image of the one, but still only an image. Let us make mind in our image. Interestingly, this first emanation of nous parallels the first hypostasis, the first emanation from the supernal source in Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, Chachma, or wisdom, the Hebrew equivalent of Naus, the first of three intellects, the father of the triad, Chachma, Bina, Dat. Also paralleling the first dissenting entity in the Gnostic Pleroma, Sophia, who in her striving and questioning tears a hole in the fabric of Eden and tumbles or gets thrown out of heaven. And from the tension created by her striving to get back into heaven, just, you know, all of matter and spirit, our whole world pops into existence. And many other comparisons, which we'll have to come back to in a separate video of comparative metaphysics and mysticism. That sounds like a fun video to do. Looking forward to it. From Naus, from wisdom, to get back to Neoplatonism, from the mind emanates the soul. The soul of the world, or as it's known by the Neoplatonists, the world soul creating a bridge between the emanator and the emanated. Standing on the boundary of reality, the world soul oscillates between looking toward the world, allowing it to maintain its illusion of independent existence, and looking wistfully back to the nous, back to the one, threatening to pull the world back into a void, back into a vacuum sucked into the womb of the one. Of course, this is not to be taken literally. It's to be taken poetically, mythologically, namely truthfully. It's a real shame, isn't it, that the full psychological depth and grandeur of these metaphysics are lost on fundamentalists, believers, and deniers alike when being read literally. Oh well. And then, back to our metaphysics, finally from the one is emanated via nous and world soul is emanated matter and our world that we know and love. All this whole system, this whole structure of emanation is all inexorably united and linked and dependent for its very being and existence upon the one. Our world merely finding itself at the extreme end of the continuum of emanation, but on the continuum no less. Borrowing on many themes that by now we can recognize, this system works to try and mend the aforementioned challenge posed by the conflicting and seemingly irreconcilable nature of the one and the many, the absolute and the relative, the infinite and the finite, the conflict that continues to be the germ agitating the oyster that is Western philosophical mysticism for centuries to follow Jewish, Christian, and Muslim alike. By positing this structure of a hierarchy of being, a great chain of being as it becomes known, there is an attempt to try and mediate between the ends of the absolute and the relative, the one and the many with also huge psychological implications relevant for us today, which will be explored separately, God willing. Besides for the metaphysics, another key theme that emerges in Neoplatonism, and is presented in the first major text of the movement, the Enneads, which was written by Plotinus' student Porphyry, recounting his master's teachings, is, it is not just the pantheistic metaphysics that become the defining characteristics of mystical theory for the ages, but also the ecstatic methodology 
by which these theories can not only be conceptualized and rationalized, but also experienced. The imperative known to the Neoplatonists as henosis, to be made one with the one, literally, to lose oneself and to be absorbed into the rupture of the deity, into the all, into the true reality, which one always is, and from there to see and experience what has been only till then a conceptual, abstract idea. To see and feel the world as it emanates from the one, to feel the great chain of being at play, pulsating existence outwards, and drawing it back into the nothingness on the inhale. The illimitable, silent, never-resting thing, rolling, rushing on, swift silence, like an all-embracing ocean tide, on which we and all the universe swim like exhalations, like expirations which are and which are not, a thing to strike us dumb, for we have no word to speak about it. To see all the diverse, multiplied phenomena to be but the final destination of a series of emanations stretching back to the One, back to God, in an unbroken ontological chain, now that sounds quite pantheistic to me. Join us next week as we continue our history of pantheism, the story of an imminent God, right through the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. Thank you for joining us, and as always, keep seeking. I want to give a shout out to our Patreons, who have been contributing to the project. It is the sweetest thing in the world, and I am so deeply touched, and the money is going to be well used. All of the names of the patrons are down in the description. My deepest love, gratitude, and appreciation to all of you. And if you'd like to join them, please do. All the links are down in the description. Catch you next time. Oh, hi there. <laughs> Wait, where are my notes? Okay, I'm gonna try once without notes. One point. Hey, I just noticed something interesting while I was editing, and I thought I would share it with you. I wasn't sure whether I should do a separate video or just include this at the end of the first video. I noticed a theme running through the thinkers here, and I just wanted to highlight them and bring up something which I thought was quite fascinating. So, as we said, I'm not going to repeat the whole video here now, don't worry. Just a very brief recap. The very beginnings of Greek thought, really pre-Greek philosophy, happens in a context of Greek mythology and theology, uh, with Hesiod's, you know, very long elaborate list of the many multiple gods, and Homer's multiple gods that have the anthropomorphic form and get involved with wars and whatnot, which represents the extremity, or the... Uh, the acme of a multiplicity involved in reality, where each god has a real part of playing in reality. And as we said, the Greek thinkers try and get away from that way of thinking towards a more unitive or monistic way of thinking. And we see that very heavily emphasized amongst the Eleatic, the Ionian, you know, Parmenides and Pythagoras and Heraclitus and all that. So that's step number one, is a move from poly, poly the many, polytheism, to a monism, a oneness, from the many to the one. Then what happens is that that gets taken to a bit of an extreme where someone like Heraclitus is saying that there is, that like everything is impermanent and, con and nothing is really real and Parmenides is like there's no change at all. It, it's almost like the, the theorems are pushing reality, pushing common sense perceptions of reality out of the way in deference to their abstractions. And what Plato tries to do, which is interesting, which we spoke about, is Plato tries to reconcile and mediate between these extremities of the, the fundamental infinitude and unity of reality with the, the multiplicity that we actually see in reality. I mean, here, there's one, two, three books. That's already three things. It's a multiplicity. And they're changing. They're getting old. You know, these things, change happens. So there's an attempt to deal with the reality face on we see a move from a pure monism to a monism that's trying to deal with the plurality of reality, some sort of dialectical monism, we can call it. And if we want to use a huge, huge, like, overgeneralization, we can say that philosophy in the modern period, when we look beyond these thinkers, moves back to a theory of plurality where the plurality of items and the individuality of items really takes preference, and we lose sight of some sort of metaphysical grounding reality that unifies everything into it. 
uh, I think that's very true of philosophy today, you know, analytical philosophy and positivistic philosophy and postmodern philosophy. And without thinking too broadly here, perhaps the need is to bring back some of that flavor of monism, to bring back a, a metaphysics of being that has some sort of unit of principle back to our very diverse and diversified and disparate and um, disharmonious reality. Because I think metaphysics makes a difference. I think ideas make a difference. And that's one of the reasons motivating this channel. That's one thing. The other thing is I want to what I wanted to try and explain or make sense or think together really what is this whole talk of the one the absolute the infinite the unchanging we all know what the many is what the transient what the moving changing multiplicitous it's, it's the things that we encounter in everyday life what is the the unchanging and why are the Greeks so obsessed with this for hundred for hundreds of years and becomes such a important problematic that drives so much of Western philosophy forward and I think there's a couple ways to explain it. One which we hinted at during the video was simply that these philosophers were actually in some, you know, when they switched their caps, they were actually mystics. And they were having very serious mystical experiences, which is actually implicated in, in some of their statements. Um, who was it that said, uh, wheresoever I turn, I find, I find myself lost in the one and the all. Plotinus certainly has mystical experiences in that his porphyry is very clear about four times in his life. He writes about in the Enneads. So that's one way, and in their mystical experience they were just encountering this infinite unity and coming back out of their mystical trips they were trying to make sense of the reality which they encountered with the reality which they felt to be very true in their experiences. That's one way to go about it. Another way is to think more platonically, more metaphysically perhaps, simply about the idea of universals. That um, To bring up our books here again. If we think about what makes all of these three things books, they're the theory is that there's some sort of universal idea or concept which they're all referencing to, which is some sort of idea of the book in abstractio. And if we want to expand that way of thinking, so this is with physical items, one, could, one would do so in ethics, and that would lead to an idea of the good, the idea of the beautiful in aesthetics. And in, in metaphysics or in simple reality, it would lead to the idea of being that all beings participate in. That's a, that's a second way which the Greeks may have thought their way um, to this idea of the ultimate. Another way, perhaps, is simply the the fact in philosophy that every every definition is only definition insofar as it has its antinomy to give it any defining validity. So day is only day because there is something called night which makes day day in comparison and in contradistinction to night. If there was no night, then we would have no category of day. It would be a nonsensical category. So therefore, to have a category of finitude, of transience, of impermanence, of imperfection, needs that means that we need a category of perfection, infinitude, um, unchangingness, the God, basically, from a metaphysical standpoint. That's, that's a, I don't know what number we're up to, fourth way. But I think a way that we can most relate to is in identity and personal identity, where there are aspects of our own identities which we know to be consistent and which we know to be permanent and things that we can see in ourselves that have been the same since we were seven, since we were 11, since we were 30, however old we are. And yet there are things, and, and most of our, it, it, it's actually a strange paradox here because so much of our personality seems to be rooted in that unchangingness and yet so much of our personality seems to be so whimsical and flimsy to really change at the drop of a hat and change based on our circumstances and which friends we're with and what, you know, chemicals we've just put into our body, uh, caffeine, alcohol, how much sleep we had the night before. So the flexibility um, and the the transience and the impermanence, the, the flowingness, to use the Heraclitian language of personality, in contradistinction to this sense of personality which seems so deep-rooted and so permanent and so fixed is perhaps a way for us to conceptualize a way which the Greeks were thinking into this um, into this dichotomy of the absolute and the relative. And I think I think also I think I'm going to cap it here. But I think that the idea of uh, relativity or subjectivity and objectivity is an idea which we're all familiar with, and it's, it's something which plagues a lot of modern thinking, a lot of modern scholarship, and and perhaps this meditation on the relationship between the absolute 
between the objective and the relative, the subjective, and maybe an interesting point of inquiry. And really, just to drop the last little thing here is, I think that the mystics ultimately, and we'll discover this when we get into later more developed philosophical mystics in the Middle Ages, in the modern period, is they tried to really break down any boundaries and any bifurcations, including that between the objective and the subjective, between the relative and the absolute, between the divine and the human, etc., etc. And the implications of that, I think, are very interesting in, in many, many fields. Uh, I think that's enough for now. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this last little uh, catch-up. And um, did you notice what I'm wearing? This is the new Seekers of Unity winter merch. <laughs> uh, if you really want to be... <laughs> um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's cool. I designed it uh, with a friend of mine. And um, <laughs> it's going to be available for purchase on... SeekersOfUnity.com. It's going to be on our Instagram and our Facebook and all kind of fun stuff like that. Um, it's silly that we're doing it, but it's fun. And uh, I guess it's a way to uh, support the project if you'd like to support, if you like what's happening here and you'd like to chip in. We do get a kickback from the merchandise purchases. And also it's a cool way to uh, identify with the brand and with the community. Not that you need to buy anything to, to be part of the community, but if you'd like to, the option is there. And on that note, keep seeking. <laughs>